my name is Lucy Wu and I'm a second year at UC San Diego. My major is human biology and I'm here with Dr. Katema Paul as part of BioClock Studio's interview crew to interview him about his work at Morehouse School of Medicine. Georgia State was an accident. I had no intention of going to Georgia State University, but in retrospect, it turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. I was uh, finished my undergraduate uh, matriculation at Howard University, and I was planning on enrolling or, or applying to Johns Hopkins University. I applied to several graduate programs, but I had my, my heart kind of set on Hopkins. But I took a break to do music, to be a music producer and, um, and uh, uh, work with groups. And I went to Atlanta, because um, at the time, that's where the, the music scene was burgeoning um, uh, most more robustly. Um, so in the course of doing music, I also had a side gig where I would DJ at uh, the radio station, um, 88.5 on Saturday nights. WRAS, and that radio station was located on Georgia State's campus. So again, at the time I was uh, applying to graduate school and I decided to walk over to the neurobiology department since I was on the campus DJing, just to see what they had going on, kind of keep my chops up before graduate school. And when I went there, I met my graduate mentor, Elliot Albers, and he encouraged me to enroll in the master's program. He said, since you're down here doing music and you're planning on going to do your PhD anyway, why not just do a master's here? you know, kind of take some core courses um, before you go to do your PhD somewhere else. And in the course of doing the master's at Georgia State um, was when I got into circadian rhythms. And um, as a master's student, I got onto a project which yielded some very early and promising results, exciting results. Uh, Elliot convinced me to stay and finish my PhD at Georgia State, which I did. And again, I think it was the best decision that I ever made. So I was moderately recruited. I had a few people offer me jobs after my postdoc. And what Peter McLeish and Morehouse offered me was the opportunity to build something. I knew that when I was young in my career, I didn't want to go into a situation that was kind of already created for me where I can just kind of fit in and fill a niche. I wanted to build uh, a lab and build a program and build something that um, would remain after I left. And Peter gave me that offer to build, to help him build a circadian rhythms and sleep disorders program at Morehouse School of Medicine. And that's what drew me back to Atlanta. And um, I have no regrets. It's been awesome. First is to get um, researchers and doctors to understand that Many of the sex differences they deal with on a, on a daily basis or in their experiments or in their practice are driven by biological factors. That's a two-way street. Let's take sleep, for instance. If we don't understand how sex influences sleep disorders, then what happens is one sex, usually the male, is much more likely to receive more effective treatments for their sleep disorders than the other sex. But let's look at that in the reverse direction. When you only study one sex, then that limits what you know about the mechanism that you're examining. So I study sleep, and if we only look at males in sleep, then that really narrows how much information I have about sleep. I'm not, I don't know how the menstrual cycle influences sleep. I don't know how hormonal changes that occur during pregnancy and postpartum recovery influence sleep. I don't know how hormonal changes that occur during menopause influence sleep. This is valuable information. This is information that can help us better understand the mechanisms that regulate sleep and hopefully design better treatments, better therapeutic um, treatments for sleep disorders. There are sex differences in sleep which may predispose to gender differences in the risks of sleep disorders. We don't know very much about sex differences in sleep, quite frankly, because the majority of studies in sleep throughout history have been done in male subjects. So what we're interested in my lab is, are any of the gender differences in the risk and incident of sleep disorders? Do biological sex differences underlie those gender differences? Art Arnold at UCLA um, developed a mouse line where he separated sex chromosome complement from 
biological sex. And what that allows is to have male mice that have an XX sex chromosome complement and female mice that have an XY sex chromosome complement. And when you reverse them that like that, then you can look at the effects of sex chromosome complement themselves on any trait that you would like to examine. For us, the traits we're examining are, is sleep. And when you're examining sex chromosome complement, what you're essentially looking at are the sex-linked genes, the genes on those chromosomes and their direct influences or whatever trait or behavior under examination. My lab is most interested in sleep homeostasis. And what that basically is, is the ability to recover from sleep loss. So in that paper, we're specifically asking questions about whether sex chromosome complement is responsible for sex differences and the ability to recover from sleep loss. And what we found is that most of the sex differences in sleep and even the ability to recover from sleep loss appear to be driven by gonadal hormones. But there are some that are driven by sex chromosome complement, specifically the ability to recover from sleep deprivation at specific times of the day. And what we've become really interested in is the time of the day during the mid-active phase, or what you would call the mid to late afternoon, where a lot of people get sleepy and certain societies have, have a siesta that allows them to nap. What we found is that there's a sex difference in mice and the propensity to sleep during that mid-active phase. Um, the males have a higher propensity than the females and that that propensity is driven in part by sex chromosome complement. And uh, right now we're very interested in finding the mechanism through which the sex chromosomes drive the propensity to sleep during that siesta period. The thing I like most about teaching is the attention. Uh, when you're doing experiments in the back of a lab, sometimes it can get lonely. Um, teaching uh, uh, gives me the opportunity to interact with students. And, um, you know, I'm being a bit facetious, but the great thing about teaching is the students. Um, to see students that you've taught um, go on to do great things, whether you've contributed to those things or not, um, it gives you a feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction that, quite frankly, very few experiments do. Um, and um, when you have bright students, that makes it all the more satisfying because they mostly go on to do great things and you can kind of hang your hat on some of their accomplishments.